Let's look at the table of processes utility through the eyes of a developer. That means we'll focus on the design and operating system interactions. This is really a primer to engage developers who may want to hack together a custom tool but haven't done the legwork to tear down the utility. I'm assuming you already know the basic usage, but just in case. Top is a system administration tool included with the PROC utilities package on most Linux distros. On my CentOS system it's part of the PROC PS next gen package. You can see the basic idea just by watching. We have a loop that periodically retrieves data and pushes updates to the terminal view. The view includes a summary area and a process list formatted for the terminal with help from the curses library. The view may be recalculated to fit the terminal size. There's a keyboard input handler to control the view. We can sort by fields. You can view the forest of parent-child relationships. It even includes a windowing subsystem. There's a few other controls such as sending signals to processes. For instance, if a user has a runaway process on the system, the administrator can diagnose and solve the problem without leaving the utility. Before we dig into the utility internals, let's think about the operating system interactions. Where do these data come from? Well, since this is a PROC utility, you can guess that most of the information is read from the PROC virtual file system. For instance, we can manually view these load averages from PROC load average, or the overall memory usage from meminfo. Each process listed has a corresponding entry in the PROC directory by process ID. Now I said that we source most data from PROC, but there are a few exceptions. Usernames come from the password file, and the active user count comes from walking the utemp file. Some adventurous people may wonder if it's possible to manipulate upstream data in PROC, or maybe add new things. Now, in general, yes, but it involves some kernel work. New PROC entries usually make sense as a kernel module, but the default entries are often built in. The best blueprint is to follow established patterns. Here's one pattern. We know that top pulls load averages from PROC load average, but where does load average really come from? Now an educated guess is that we need help from the kernel probably the scheduler and system timer. Well, there's two parts to this story, the load time initialization and the runtime maintenance, which includes updating the load average values and mediating access from user land. The scheduler core declares a global array of three long integers representing the 1, 5, and 15 minute load averages. Your standard C compiler forces uninitialized values to zero at compile time, and the system loader provides a static memory location. Towards the end of the boot process, before init launches, the kernel performs hundreds of tasks organized into eight tiers of callbacks. One of those levels is for file system initializers, which includes the proc load average init call. Ah, that doesn't seem to be the case for this kernel. In more recent kernels, this module init has been replaced by a file system init call. Anyway, this init call defines an accessor function to print the values of these variables. This print function is mapped to the open file operation for load average. Finally, the init process, in my case system D, mounts PROC. So to recap, the Linux kernel is compiled with static storage for these three load average values. At load time, the PROC file system creates an entry for load average with a special function to display the values when the file is opened. Now with the system up and running, it's time to keep the information correct. The scheduler defines the function that updates the global load averages. This update function is called whenever the timer interrupt fires, once per CPU per time slice. XTime update is called from the architecture dependent timer interrupt for the target system your kernel was compiled for. So while your system is running, the hardware timer periodically triggers these timer routines, one of which updates the global load calculations. This was one example of tracing a data source used by TOP. There's over 75 more that I'll break down in the write-up on my website. Following the metrics in TOP can have far-reaching consequences for developing your own utilities and for understanding the Linux kernel in general. Now that we know where data comes from, let's go back to the utility and talk design. Before we dig into code, it's helpful to know that everything that happens in TOP drives the I.O. task. Now that is, performing simple reads from the data source, formatting it to an internal buffer, then writing the contents to the terminal interface. This simple chore gets complicated when you want optimized behavior. 
That means reading and writing only what you need, when you need it, with few instructions and little memory. The result is a daunting web of macros, signals, callbacks, and buffering tricks that take advantage of OS and terminal behavior. But in the end, we're simply reading input and writing output. The top.c source has over 6,000 lines of fairly dense procedural code spread over more than 100 functions. Optimizations over the years have detracted from the readability somewhat. Nevertheless, I'll try to peel back the layers of logic and explain the underlying strategy. Main is short at just 40 lines, but that's long enough to see the basic idea. We begin by initializing the utility, which includes customizing signal handlers, reading the command line flags from the user, reconfiguring the terminal settings, and setting default values for the global window structures. Then we enter an infinite loop. We start by building the display frame. All the real work happens here, reading, writing, and redrawing the display. Then we build a time spec representing the amount of time to wait until the next frame update. Finally, we block execution until either the time is elapsed or the user presses a key. The blocking mechanism uses the standard POSIX pselect syscall, which monitors both time delay and the file descriptor, standard input in this case. When execution picks back up, we handle any pending input and repeat the loop all over again. Let's talk about the signal handlers initialized early on. It's important to know about signals because they may interrupt normal execution at any time. One consequence of hijacking the terminal is that when the utility is interrupted, the terminal may be in an unusable state. The solution is to catch interruptions with a custom handler that restores the previous terminal state before calling the default handler. Before top takes over the terminal, it saves the existing state to a global structure. If any disruptive signals arrive, this known good terminal state is restored. Now burn this pattern into your memory. It's, it's very common in Unix-like systems. There's another important signal mechanism. If top receives a continue signal or a window change signal, the terminal dimension should be recomputed on the next update. We saw this earlier when I resized the window. Mechanically, this is done as part of a normal frame update, but a global flag is used to trigger the procedure. Note the volatile qualifier, which hints that it may change outside of expected execution. In this case, it's set in a custom signal handler, which may fire at any time. Now we'll look at how to build a single frame. A frame includes the full contents of a single update displayed on the terminal. The frame make procedure works from top to bottom, building the summary area, the interactive message line, which is normally clear, and the window area holding the task list. This window area is subdivided into column fields with a header row. Now let's match what I described with the code in frame make. I can fit the first 30 lines or so on the screen and it looks like all of these elements are visible. Here's the summary area procedure. The message row handler is simply a terminal capability sequence to clear the row. Then we have the task list procedure for a single window. The task headers and field handlers are buried here in window show. You see that there's a lot more going on here but I want to push onward. Oh, I'll mention that at the end we force any lingering buffer data to the terminal. This completes a single frame output from top to bottom. I want to shift gears and do one deep dive into the code to illustrate my earlier point that all we're really doing is reading and writing data at the lowest levels. Since we've traced the origin of the load average variables in the kernel, let's complete the chain by tracing the reading and writing of those values to the terminal. It turns out we won't have to go far. Load average is part of the summary, so we'll look in the summary show function. We know that the load averages are at the top, so we expect the work to happen early. Right here in the first dozen lines is a call to show special, that is two layers of functions evaluated as arguments. The data for the entire top line of the summary, including the load average, is read in as part of this sprint uptime evaluation. It becomes an argument to show special, which writes these data to the terminal. String print uptime has a dedicated helper source file. Here we have a global buffer that will hold the entire top line. The function returns a pointer to this buffer. The other global buffer array will hold the floating point values representing the load average. About 100 lines into the function is where we'll read in the load averages and format them to the global buffer. The reading happens in this load average function, which takes us to yet another source file. This source file also includes a multi-purpose global buffer that will hold results. Later in the file is the load average retrieval function. This file to buff macro does the actual reading from proc load average into that global buffer. 
scanf extracts and formats the global buffer content into these three local variables. These values were moved to the pointers provided to the function, which were passed through the sprintUptime function. Let's look at the file to buff macro to find the actual read syscall. Here's the actual read. Let's jump back to summary show in the top source and look again at the show special function. We just saw that this function returns the whole top line, including the load averages formatted as text. Show special itself wraps the actual write. It performs extra parsing of the special console substrings, but the real action is at the end here in the puff macro. We're concatenating a whole line with the end line term cap. So this puff macro, it's defined in the header file. The inputs are formatted to this string variable, eventually copied here, and dumped to the terminal via curses and put p. So that's the logical trip through the top utility for the load average. We can trace similar paths for the other data fields. Now we've barely scratched the surface, but I think I'll end the presentation here at 10 minutes. I didn't get to go into detail on many of the supporting ideas, such as the task sorting callbacks or the window structures. Check out my written version, which has more detailed discussions of the namespace, data structures, external data sources, optimizations, and better diagrams of the execution logic. Oh, and many thanks to Jim Warner for developing and maintaining this utility.